Well, hello everyone, this is uh, Chris back again with The Ancient Scholar. Uh, I'm actually uh, meeting up with a few uh, people to do some uh, studying in lab today. And uh, before they come, I want to go ahead and just uh, talk about something. Actually, this is a, a request that I received. Uh, somebody wants to wanted me to talk a little bit about the physiology of uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. This would be typically in the form of either CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, or BiPAP, which is known as um, bi-level positive airway pressure. Uh, so, to that uh, to that end, I'll go ahead and just uh, maybe do a series of videos talking about the basic um, physiology of CPAP and BiPAP, and just um, positive airway pressure in general. Uh, specifically, non-invasive positive airway pressure. You can see behind me. This has been the um, kind of the flagship product that uh, most facilities uh, reach for when they need to look at doing um, non-invasive uh, positive pressure ventilation. This is, of course, the um, the BiPAP Vision uh, through Respironics, which is actually uh, currently being phased out. I believe it's the, the the Philips V60 is becoming very popular, and this this is actually being phased out, but. Uh, uh, many of us still know and love uh, this machine, the BiPAP uh, Vision, uh, which which uh, subsequently actually does do CPAP, believe it or not. Um, a lot of people um, don't realize that, that we can do CPAP uh, with this, this machine. But anyway, let's just go ahead and talk about the, the basic physiology of CPAP, or, or just positive airway pressure. And um, first of all, I want to talk about what are the indications? What, why would I put somebody into some sort of form of uh, positive airway uh, pressure, non-invasive positive airway pressure. And I think the main indications are, um, your primary indications would be congestive heart failure, uh, certain types, uh, or certain situations of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease where we have respiratory failure. That can either be uh, hypoxemic or it can be hypercapnic. Um, so it can be a hypoxia problem or it can be a uh, hypoventilation problem or failure to ventilate effectively. Um, there is certainly evidence that uh, positive airway pressure is effective for um, hypoxia, hypoxemia, and uh, even certain types of community-acquired pneumonia. Uh, certainly if the community-acquired pneumonia is associated with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Okay, so those are the indications. Um, I'd also like to throw in there uh, on the side as a side indication is is going to be uh, sleep uh, obstructive, not central, but obstructive sleep apnea, which is something perhaps I can talk about a little later on. This request uh, was made by somebody who's in critical care transport, and um, they are now using new ventilators uh, that can perform uh, both CPAP and BiPAP, and they're just wanting me to kind of review some of the physiology of positive airway pressure. So hopefully everyone can see the, the board behind me here. Um, let's just talk about um, positive airway pressure, a non-invasive positive airway pressure. Um, so non-invasive positive um, airway pressure. Um, I'll just throw that up there. Uh, <laughs> NIPAP, we'll say, non-invasive positive airway pressure. And that includes CPAP, CPAP with pressure support, uh, and um, BiPAP or uh, bi-level. Uh, BiPAP is actually, a, I believe, a trademark name. Um, and you could call it generically bi-level non-invasive ventilation if you wanted to. But anyway, hopefully everyone gets gets the the idea. So let's just talk about what what positive airway pressure does uh, physiologically. Hopefully everyone can still see me here. The camera's kind of in a weird spot. Um, so let's just go ahead and generically talk about how this works. Uh, so we talk about administering positive airway pressure. It actually does um, several things. Uh, first of all, it provides positive positive uh, pressure and, and as you and as you might expect that positive air, uh, that positive pressure is being delivered and um, of, of course that is going to uh, decrease the amount of work that I have to do to to inhale uh, obviously because I'm getting um, some some support if you will some some positive pressure kind of like um, I imagine uh, something like CPAP where I have one continuous pressure, you kind of throw your head out of the window of moving cart 80 miles an hour and you get that big rush um, of wind. That is um, physiologically somewhat analogous to uh, this concept of CPAP. So positive pressure, um, obviously that's going to help decrease the work of breathing. Um, another thing that uh, positive pressure is going to do is it's going to recruit, it's going to recruit alveoli. 
and this is very important. Um, certainly in, in cases of, let's say, congestive heart failure, where you know, I have maybe some pulmonary edema, and uh, my alveoli uh, perhaps lose the surfactant or lose their ability to stay inflated. Because remember, when we exhale, our alveoli do, don't completely collapse. We actually don't want our alveoli to completely collapse. We want our alveoli to stay open. Uh, when we exhale, we want uh, the residual volume and, and ultimately the functional residual capacity to keep the alveoli open. However, in some cases, such as congestive heart failure, the alveoli can collapse. Now, we know uh, through um, Laplace's law, or the young, I believe it's the young Laplace equation, um, that a, a sphere or an alveoli that's kind of collapsed and shrunken down is going to be significantly harder to inflate than something that is, is, is already open to some extent, partially inflated. Kind of like a balloon. When I blow up a balloon, the hardest uh, time that I have to get that balloon bl blown up is at the very beginning when the balloon is uh, shrunken down and real small. But, but once I get past that initial and it blows up a little bit, then it's a lot easier to blow it up. The, uh, the an analogous situation occurs in the alveoli. If I can put some positive pressure in there, I can keep the alveoli open. I can recruit them or open more up, keep more open, and I can prevent them from collapsing or help prevent what's known as atelectasis or collapse of the alveoli. So I can ultimately recruit alveoli, and that's done by positive pressure, and it increases something known as a functional residual capacity. And if you take a deep, if you take a breath in and a breath out, and then you blow out as much as you can, what's left over is known as the functional residual capacity, uh, uh, for, for lack of better words. Um, actually, I believe fun the, the, the technical definition for functional residual capacity is at the end of, of, of exhalation. Um, you have your expiratory uh, reserve volume and your residual volume, and those two volumes um, at the end of a, a normal tidal volume breath make up um, the functional residual capacity. And then what's left over after I have forced exhalation is known as a residual volume. Be that as it may, whatever's left over um, is the functional residual capacity, and if we can enhance the functional residual capacity through positive pressure. We can recruit alveoli, we can prevent alveolar collapse, and we can ultimately, um, as another consequence of this, I can increase the surface area. I can increase the surface area of uh, my alveolar capillary membrane. And this is very handy because this, uh, it, it ha this increased surface area allows for more um, surface area for oxygen and carbon dioxide to move in and out uh, with their, their respective gradients. Um, in this situation, if I were to administer positive airway pressure non-invasively, be it CPAP or BiPAP, what I am doing is I am doing the an analog. This is an analog to adding PEEP to a patient that's on a ventilator. If somebody's on a ventilator and I add PEEP, positive expiratory, uh, end expiratory pressure, that PEEP does exactly the same thing as CPAP or um, a BiPAP does in that the, with PEEP there's always a pressure present even at the end of exhalation and that the pressure that's always present is helping to keep alveoli open, to increase the surface area, and to ultimately increase oxygenation. So CPAP and, and, and PEEP are really analogous to one another. They do the exact same physiological thing. So lots of good things can come from non-invasive positive airway pressure. Um, I'd like to say that there certainly are some negative consequences we need to be very careful about. Anytime that we increase the interthoracic pressure, of course, um, that sets us up for things like breath stacking, um, auto peep, um, uh, air trapping. Um, it can also um, increase interthoracic pressure can uh, put pressure on the heart and great vessels, and obviously that can decrease preload to the right side of the heart, decrease cardiac output. Um, so there are some, some negative consequences uh, to this that we need to be very careful about. But